Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. Listen, nothing says pump the brakes on your fitness progress like being hit with an injury, all right? Now, the question is, how do we best prevent injuries, right? Is it warming up? Is it cooling down? Is it stretching? But here's the thing. We don't see other species needing to warm up in order to perform, right? Without getting an injury. You're not watching the Discovery Channel and then you hear, here we have the wild jaguar hunting its prey in the bush. Out oh, there he goes. He's chasing the wild gazelle. The jaguar's on his hot on his trail, but he's pulling up. He's pulling up. He's pulled a hammy. The wild jaguar has pulled a hammy. He takes a loss with it. We don't hear that, right? We don't hear that because it's not about stretching, all right? It's not about this idea that we need to warm up and cool down. Those are components that we can take advantage of, but it's really about how we live our day-to-day -day lives, right? And staying ready. And so that's what we're going to talk about today with the very best person on the planet in talking about this subject matter of mobility, of being ready, right? Being a supple leper, right? He's the New York Times bestselling author of this incredible book that everybody should have, right? It should be in your library. If you're into, if you're into movement, fitness, all the good stuff, you just want to know stuff, got to have that book in your library, all right? He's been on the show. This was way back in the day. He's new and improved. He's progressed. He's gotten better with age, all right? He's a fine wine. It's my guy. And uh, we're going to get him on here in just a moment. But first, I want to give you something uh, that has helped me today, all right? My son, you know, both of my sons have been going through stuff, right? My, my kindergarten son is going to first grade, and so now he's like, today he's at a, a new school as like a test day, right? I didn't have no test day when I was in school. Like, I just show up, right? Your mom just kicks you out the car like, you know, good luck. But today we're so conscientious about all these little things we do with our kids. So he's having a, a prep day at this school. And um, so, you know, it's a little kind of stressful process for him just kind of going through the motions because he likes kindergarten, right? He likes being where he is. And so we had to have a talk. We were up a little bit later than normal. Plus, I was uh, reviewing my son, my older son, 17, his paper that he did at the last minute. All right. So just kid, they will throw the curveballs at you. All right. So this was my life. And so even though I wrote Sleep Smarter, you know, sometimes, again, life's going to throw curveballs, especially if you have kids. So today, this morning, I need a little extra. And so I did a double pack. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you're doing the Four Sigmatic coffee, all right, so I did a double pack, all right? So I had to get I had to get a little bit more of that in my veins. And, man, I feel amazing. And to, and to be real, you know, it doesn't have that weird kind of crazy caffeine spike that you might be accustomed to with conventional Folgers in your cup, right? This is very balanced because it's a symbiotic kind of blend with the coffee, organic. So you're not dealing with like, I'm going go ahead and make me a hot cup of Folgers with pesticides and rodenticides, please. That's what you're really drinking, all right? You got to get the organic good stuff, all right? So that's, it's organic, plus we've got the medicinal mushrooms in there, all right? So this one has lion's mane. University of Malaya found that lion's mane actually has been clinically proven to increase something called neurogenesis. You're probably like, Sean, what is neurogenesis? That's the creation of brain cells, all right? Neurogenesis, literally creation of new brain cells. How powerful is that? I promise you, Starbucks can't do that, all right? It just can't. The unicorn frappuccino cannot do that. It'll probably kill brains. No matter of fact, I know it's going to kill brain cells. This does the opposite, all right? So please understand, powerful stuff here, all right? So Four Sigmatic, their mushroom coffee. I had the Lion's Made blend for the brain-boosting capabilities. They've also got a blend with cordyceps for performance. I always have that uh, pre-workout. It's one of my favorite things. So pop over there, check them out. Do yourself a favor. Get on top of the Four Sigmatic, all right? So it's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash model. And guess what? 15% off everything, all right? Secure the bag alert. I just, that just happened, all right? So make sure that you take advantage of this incredible offer. It's exclusive here at the Model, model Health Show, all right? So foursigmatic.com forward slash model, 15% off. It's one of my favorite things on the planet. Head over, check them out. And now let's get to iTunes Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled, Great Content, Great Role Model by KT Ka. The Model Health Show is probably the best podcast about health and well-being out there. Sean covers all the bases, from physical health to relationship health to mental health, and he does it while making you feel like he was a good friend or an older brother. I look up to Sean as a respected mentor. He's the role model I never had growing up. 
Sean's the best. Now that right there, that is incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's an honor and great gift and privilege to be that in your life. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for heading over to iTunes and leaving me those reviews. You know I appreciate it so much. So please keep them coming. If you've yet to leave a review, please pop over and do so. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and our topic of the day. Our guest today is Dr. Kelly Starrett, and he's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. And by the way, I usually don't read bios, but I have to read this because he's done a lot of dope stuff, which has revolutionized how coaches, athletes, and everyday humans approach movement and athletic performance. It is also, here's, this is crazy, it is also the recommended supplemental reading for the Movement and Mobility 101 course. Dr. Starrett is co-founder of San Francisco CrossFit and MobilityWad.com. You got to head over to MobilityWad.com, best stuff ever, where he shares his innovative approach to movement, mechanics, and mobility with coaches and athletes. He travels around the world teaching his wildly popular movement and mobility course and works with elite Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard forces, athletes from the NFL, NBA, NHL and MLB, and national and world-ranked strength and power athletes. He consults with Olympic teams and universities and is featured speaker at strength and conditioning conferences worldwide. And Dr. Starrett's work is not limited to coaches and athletes. His methods apply equally as well to children, desk jockeys, and anyone dealing with injury and chronic pain. He believes that every human being should know how to move and be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Host Show, my friend, Kelly Starrett. What's going on? Always good to be back. Oh, man. I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you today. We were already chopping it up before the show, and you're just always dropping some serious knowledge. But listen, I want to start with the origin story, man. I, I need to know the Kelly Starrett superhero origin story. Were you always nuts about human movement when you were like five? Like, how did this all get started? Man, it's so it's so boring. <clears throat> I um, have a huge genetic drive to move. Like r- right now in the world where we're starting to understand the, the interface of genetics and sort of on expression, right? How you move, which diet is better for you, you know, how you can boost and train and optimize. It's not g- genetic determinism, but when you compare my genetics to everyone else's genetics, my desire to move and train is like 98th percentile. So I've always been super nerd, let's go out, comma, I fell into some serious strength, not strength issue, but serious technical sports early on. And I remember moments where, you know, someone was explaining something and it was technical and I was like, this is it, I'm home. This is, this is my jam. And it's interesting, early on, my mom was actually a psychologist Mm. and I, was privy to some of like behind the scenes of how our brains work. Uh And one of the things that she was a single mom, you know, I was, I sat, I went to a lot of her classes and sat in the back and read Tintin. Right. But I was always listening, you know, and, and watching, watching the monkey stories and, you know, just, you know, paying attention. I mean, when you take your, you know, seven year old human sexuality, I mean, like it's real. So I appreciate (laughs) you mom. But uh, one of the things I, I learned early about myself is that I have a penchant for pattern recognition. And that, and when I understood that, it really made school easier for me because as soon as I could understand how something I was learning related to something else, I already learned where I was going and I could see the 30,000 foot view. It gave me reason to, to noodle on the, the obsessive detail, but I always was good at picking up the new, the skill pattern. So I apply that to all this you know, now in retrospect, you see it even easier, you know, and I'll tell you, even to this day, we still define who's the best athlete in the room. The cute who can pick up the new skill of fastest, that girl who can backflip and skateboard and throw a ball. And like, that's, you're like, oh, you know, that girl's on my, you know, she's on my kickball team. She's, you know, she's on my hobby sport team. You know who that person is. They were always there and they weren't necessarily the best at training for sport. They were the best at, integrating all these diverse skills and and then being you'd be surprised on the football field you'd be like what happened who who is that person you know and um so that pattern recognition with desire to train really if i'm honest with myself it my life looks like a straight line between where i am now and literally when i was a little kid 
you know, chasing, chasing ski gates in Europe on the FIS, you know, chasing FIS gates. And, and um, what I'll tell you is, you know, I'm so grateful that I've had the experience that I've had. I was a high level national team athlete. I injured myself through an overuse training problem that kind of kicked me into being done with that life and going to physio school. And, and then couple with the time, you know, all of that experience being in physio school with the birth of the internet, with the birth of modern strength and conditioning, which was really a rev- revelation with really understanding. I mean, I read the zone back in what, like 98, you know, 99 is when I first read the zone. You know, and that was like, I mean, what I should, I should not eat these rice cakes and drink this Diet Coke. Like what, you know, (laughs) this this is what everyone does. So, you know, already starting to think about it back then and sort of being exposed and it takes a while to set. And so I, I'm lucky because when all of this hit, I didn't have 10,000 hours of experience. I had a hundred thousand hours, but then the tools were there to be able to talk and to film, you know, I mean, it's it's hard to remember, but there was a time when the iPhone did not have a video camera. I know, wait for it. Mm. There was a time <laughs> when the iPhone did not automatically publish to YouTube or Vimeo. And that's when we started Mobility One, right at the cusp of that. And one of the things that was really we're lucky about is that we had a strength and conditioning facility in the city and you know, an early CrossFit, we're the 21st CrossFit, and it was in a time where there was no Edo Portal. There was no Cal Strength. There were, you know, Penley was out in a garage. All the masters were, you know, are were working quietly and privately. You could, didn't have access to them. You had you had to go like seek, knock on their doors. And so we had the we had the luxury of becoming competent in gymnastics, really beginning to understand running and cardiorespiratory training because of our friends. We became competent at powerlifting. You know, I Mike Bergner was my sensei, and all, you know, in Olympic lifting, and all of a sudden. We had a chance to practice a lot and I was a young physio and then the internet broke and we had an audience that was looking for connection between how we're moving and how we're feeling. And it's really interesting. I really appreciate your, in your intro, you say, you know, the, the, the Jaguar never pulls up on the hammy, you know, the, the, the real thing that we're going to struggle with. And I want to change this conversation about is what is, we're afraid to say, Movement is skill-based, right? In that our free will and the environment gives us a a lot of wiggle room. And because the human being is so extraordinary at compensation, at dealing, at not sleeping, at eating, drinking alcohol, of being sleep deprived, that, you know, of just moving poorly, we can buffer that for a long time. It's sometimes difficult for us to say these things cause these outcomes, right? I did this, I got injured. And what we want to do is, is we have to sort of take this multidisciplinary approach. And that approach is saying, hey, look, the human physiology and the breadcrumbs of all the formal movement training that we've had from in martial arts, in track and field, in Pilates, in yoga, if you go into those fields, they all say the same thing about the way the shoulder works, about the way the spine works, about how you're supposed to stiffen your trunk and breathe. It's all there. And it's called practice. It's called those disciplines. But because we didn't have access to them and we couldn't compare, all of a sudden it was really difficult for us to be like, oh yeah, I heard that gymnast coach say that. And Ido Portal said that. And the yogis have been saying that for 2000 years. Match that suddenly with the fact that we are now more sedentary than ever before because of our lives, because of the work, that what happens that, you know, the environment has shifted around us, the access to easy sugar, the fact that we can be on our laptops and phones until late at night and disrupting our sleep. You know, we, we try to tell kids, you know, and parents were like, hey, look, if your kid gets into bed a half hour earlier, just a half hour, every two weeks, that kid gets an extra night's sleep. That's how much mm. extra sleep it is a half hour earlier. And you're like, holy crap. It means you can sleep two extra days a month if you just got into bed a half hour earlier. And what we don't realize is suddenly is that we, we don't – we aren't growing up in conditions and I'm not pining for the old days, right? Cause they weren't better. I mean, you know, that common commercial with like Samsung right now, he's like, we are living in the age and he is right. Like the, the future is here and it looks, it's wild. Comma, the things that existed, the games, the walking, the activity, the, the eating, 
the downtime, the incandescent bulbs, it was all different. And I think it's important to understand that, like I said, human beings are so good at managing and buffering that it's difficult for us to see the relationship between inputs and outputs, especially since the, the, the experiment that we're running is so long. And I think we have to keep this context of how long we're all going to live. You're going to be 100 years old. If you're listening to this podcast, you are going to be 100 years old. And it's difficult for us to say, yeah, I smoked for 20 years. and I didn't get cancer until I was 70, mm -hmm. right? I, it's hard to say that those things were related. But what we know is that a lot of the transgressions of movement, the, a lot of transgressions of breathing, the diet, nutrition doesn't show up right away. And thank goodness it doesn't because we would be so fragile that there would be no human beings, right? But I think we've been really afraid to say, hey, look, do this because it causes cancer. Don't do this and you won't get hurt. Instead, let's change this conversation from one around from fear and injury and negativity. And let's say, hey, here's why we make these decisions, because they give us better access to our potential. Let's make this move in this way because we can move faster. Right, we can move faster more often. Let's eat this way because not because our blood panel says it, but like, hey, I can that opportunity cost of that training session is much smaller, which means I can get more volume in, which means and my hypothesis now is that we are not working at the limits of our capacity at all. Mm -hmm. We feel like we are. Our brains are telling us that we are still kicking ass, even though we're redlined, but we're redlined in third gear. And I think when we begin to give people these holistic, common sense, sustainable, and granular approaches to understanding how their bodies work, very simple, right? What are the key principles? Your book is a great example of just basics. Like, why don't you know this? Because if you know this, then you can be a big boy and a big girl and make those decisions. Yes, I'm going to have a coffee after four o'clock. Oh, and I'm now can't go to sleep. Oh, so, hey, I'm going to drink this ball of red wine to deal with my anxiety and going to sleep. Oh, that wrecks my sleep. Hey, you know, it's easy for us as humans to get caught up in these cycles. But when we come back to first principles, and again, that's that pattern recognition part of my brain, then it really is simple to make small decisions and to set up the environment where I'm going to automatically do a better thing and one that gives me better choices. So let me give you guys an example. And I know I've been running my mouth a lot here, but oh, this is good. Um, if you you're standing as we're talking to each other, I'm sitting on a stool, right? I'm kind of I'm sitting in basically a wide sumo stance, and I've got a little tiny bar stool, but I'm 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 just leaning. I just went for like a two hour paddle, so I'm a little cooked. And um, what I'll tell you is that the if we say take the word posture, right? Posture is the Latin word root for posture is position. And what we're really talking about is the position of your spine. And that is literally what we've come to understand as posture. And so even the fact that we don't use the real language, spinal position, we say posture, it gives us a, an out, I have bad posture. But you would never brag about having bad spine position, right? And the issue is that we say, hey, posture is important. And, and then the physios or the, the doctors or the scientists come out and say, well, actually, it's hard to correlate bad posture with pain. Right. And, and, and dysfunction. And what I want to say to everyone is stop doing that. Stop saying we should care about posture because we're worried about pain. What we know is that when we improve position, we improve function and we restore function. And usually pain goes away with that when we restore function. But what I can tell you is that when you are in dysfunctional positions of posture, rounded back, sitting on your bum, tucked under, right, shoulders slouched forward, your shoulders don't work right. You can't take a big breath. You can't put your arms over your head. You can't stabilize your trunk. Your pelvic floor turns off. And all of a sudden, this is not a conversation about do this because you make it hurt. This is a conversation of, hey, if you just want to be and, and exist at a 30% human level, that's your total God-given right. But if you're talking about performance and longevity, then what we know is best practice is that we can make decisions that are about function and capacity instead of fit, uh, decisions that are based on fear. You know, I love four sigmatics. I'm such a fan. I love the chaga is my, it's my jam. Laird Hamilton put me onto the chaga. Right. And, you know, I try to drink more tea during the day because 
I feel better during the day. And when I feel better during the day, I'm a little bit more lucid. I can interage with my kids. At four o'clock, I don't get the, the lulls, right? I sleep better. And that's a function of me drinking some more water-based beverages and not just caffeine during the day. So what we want to do is help people see, and this is a greater conversation about position and mechanics, which is really the conversation about why our bodies should look a certain way when we move, even though we can be creative and that there are fundamental principles underneath the way the body is organized. And then we can then deliberate around functionality versus purpose, right? And, you know, I think, you know, if I take my hat off and I put my keys in my hat, my hat is no longer serving as a hat. Its, its function is to hold my keys. And it functions fine like that. If I wear a shoe with an arch support all the time, <clears throat> my foot is functioning fine by using the support of the arch, but it's no longer being able to act with its purpose and design. And when we start having those conversations on top of helping people make sense of this crazy lifestyle that we're all living, now we're going to be 100 and you and I are going to be stealing cars and racing at 100 and we're going to be doing you know, knucklehead <laughs> things at 100 and that's the way it should be I just it's difficult for us to keep the long view in our heads yeah and that's that's how all of this gets there right yeah man that's so so powerful there's there's so many insights there and you know one of the things i want to go back to really, really quickly is this concept which when you said it, it's just like you're so right because i've been studying this for the last month of what what is the actual human capacity and Many experts agree, like there's just certain things that we can't do, right? And you saying that we we are maxed out and in third gear, right? And really understanding we, we've got this thing called the central governor in our brains that are controlling the whole thing. And a lot of times it's based on your perception of reality, your perception of what's possible, and of course your physical ability, but it it's not the biggest uh, thing it's taken into account. You know, we've got a lot more potential, but we have to retrain our thinking and thus retraining our body as well. So he's really pointing us to the fact that we need to take care of what's going on upstairs. And uh, you also mentioned the, of course, you know, I mentioned this in the intro as well, Mobility Wad. So let's talk about why did you start Mobility Wad? And also folks that don't know, what the heck is a Wad? <laughs> wad, right. It's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not like a tissue Wad. It's, um, the idea here is that Wad is a shorthand for workout of the day. And um, when we started, we used the word mobility workout of the day. First of all, is that the word mobility wasn't used at all. There was a reference to Eric Cressy, and I think he made a DVD called Magnificent Mobility a long time ago. And uh, as a physical therapist, I mobilized tissues. And so what we found was that I wanted a word that didn't mean stretching, because stretching had really come to mean something else, right? And what I'll tell you today is that mobility is a word that's now been convoluted. It means like, it's like the word extreme or core, you know, like, what are you doing? Work on mobility. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So let me define mobility first. First of all, mobility means that I have the requisite base range of motion that all of my tissues should be able to have. This means that the physiology, the structure and geometry of the body suggests what normal range of motion is for each of us. And what turns out is that if you go into the experts, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, American Academy of Family Practitioners, the physical therapists, Bible, Norkin, and Weiss, if you, if you look at all of these people who've studied range of motion, we have basically all agreed within a few degrees of what normal baseline function should look like in each joint, right? Joint based. So that's well and good. And, and in physical therapy school, I had to memorize all those things, right? Well, it turns out what no one had done for me was compare what my body should do with what I was doing when I squatted, what I was doing when I got into a pistol. So it turns out for the average person, we don't have to memorize those body range of motions because we have a language called push up, air squat, squatting all the way down with your heels on the ground, getting into a lunge, running, putting your arms over your head effectively. And you know what's, what's nice is that gives us real benchmarks around what we're supposed to be able to do in terms of just straight raw tissues. Comma, there's also this software component to it. 
And what we know is that, you know, your practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. That's how your brain is wired. That's why we practice skills. That's why you did all those crazy skill drills, right, over and over again in sports so that you could ingrain a pattern so that those neurons could literally wire together. The oligodendrocytes, those Schwann cells, would come in and lay the myelin in and reinforce that neural pattern so that it would be easier to do it. So why habits are so hard to break. It's so difficult to wire together to create a habit. It's also even more difficult to fire and wire apart because we have to physically break down those myelin sheaths and create a new pathway. So mobility is not only do I have the joint capsule range of motion or my, is my interstitial tissue, my interstitium, the fascia, does that, does that slide or my muscle stiff? But I also have this software that says, does my brain know how to put me into stable positions? Does my brain know how to organize the body and have the control that it needs? Which means that's 50% of the score is skill. That's why we teach fundamental movements to kids and then continue to build on them. So like I said, you know, one of the things that we ask about is, you know, as we're having this conversation about mobility, the one thing is, hey, do you, can your tissues get there? And then do you have control of your tissues? And what we'll see is that when we look at skills, we want to make sure that skills and training leads to open positions, that, that those skills and abilities scale from kids to Olympic athletes, from children and youth athletes all the way up to my geriatric patients, that the principles are the same for our adaptive athletes as they are for my MMA fighters. It is the same principles. And when we suddenly can't derive consilience. When you're saying one thing and it doesn't jive with the principles of what I'm saying, someone has a problem in their thinking because what's happening now is that there are lots of ways to get to the end. We know that all roads lead to Rome and it's okay to have styles. You're, you know, the soldier from on it. You're all about the, you know, kettlebells and, and great. And there's a lot of ways to be working on those, get you to those shapes and positions, but the principles and the physiology remains constant. The environmental considerations remain constant. We just turn them up and turn them down. So when you suddenly get to mobility, what we have found more and more now through the workout of the day is that, hey, we want position to be part of the conversation of the modern physical practice. And when I say physical practice, I'm not talking about just training for an hour. I'm talking about your physical practice starts when you go to bed and how well you sleep and how dense you sleep. That's part of your physical practice. What you do first thing in the morning and how you prime yourself, the foods you eat, how much non-exercise activity you have during the day, your ability to downregulate, did you breathe hard, all of those things. And then we can talk about training. All of those things constitute your physical practice. But what we've tried to say is, hey, look, the issue is that a lot of times we can buffer poor positions for a long time until all of a sudden you're like, what do you mean I can't squat all the way down? What do you mean I can't put my arms over my head or take a full breath? What do you mean my shoulder comes forward in Kimura? And so what we've done then is said, hey, let's put position and value position as much as we value strength as much as we value speed, as much as we value cardiorespiratory conditioning. And really position is a hallmark of efficiency. And ultimately the way we train and think is that we say, hey, look, I hear are your positions. You've got it, you're solid, we're working on it. It's a moving target. It changes day to day based on who you are and what's going on. But can you maintain that shape and position under load, under a little stress, when you're breathing hard, when you're going fast, when you got to do more than five in a row, right? What do you look like at the end of your 5K race? Do you look like the beginning? Well, there's a really interesting diagnostic around your position. And what we've said forever is as long as you went faster, that was good enough. And now we know that that's short-term thinking. And so what we can really say is the skilled athlete can transfer the positions between sports between training modalities faster and faster and faster. And suddenly what you have is what someone else, and, I, and I'm blanking on the name, calls repetition without repetition. And that's it. So that I never, when I'm snowboarding down some steep face, I never want to be thinking about my feet or my breathing. I want to be thinking about where the board's going, what's coming next, the inputs. I got to get back to no mind. 
But right. that's why training is so important and why we need to take sometimes take the high intensity out now because we're here and put the skill and mindfulness back in. These are skilled training sessions and there's a time to just be a piece of meat. Right. I, we get it. But and the world has the world has changed in 10 years. Yeah. But what about with with that getting into position when we're getting into position and learning that skill? Is, is the word stretching, is that how we go about doing it? You know, there are thousands and thousands of people right now being told by the trainers that stretching is the way. So what, what, is our, what is our path to get there? Well, the key here around, you know, restoration of position. One is, the first thing I'll say is, you know, let's move away from what we call press and guess, right? That's a good way to put out fires. My knee hurts. That's the top of the business today, not how well you're squatting. That's second conversation. But today your knee hurts, your elbow hurts, your back hurts. What is it about your environment that has changed? Why, why did those tissues become sensitized? Why did your brain, which, you know, we talk about the central governor theory. And if you guys haven't read Endure by Alex Hutchinson, you got to read it. It just came out. It's fabulous. But also understanding that pain is highly subjective and, and radically there are a lot of things that can affect that. I can do the same thing for 20 years and wake up with chronic pain one day. Why? Because I suddenly became sensitized, right? I've been running this way forever. All of a sudden my knee hurts. What happened? You know, we don't know. And it's impossible for us to say. Turns out you haven't slept for the last three months. You've been highly stressed. Your volume changed and you've been eating like a child. So Mm -hmm. maybe that's a component to it, right? We're going to have to address that. But what we want to do now is break that pain cycle. And th- there's a lot of things we can do to desensitize a tissue, reperfuse a tissue, get blood back in there, get some hydration back in there, right? We can restore your motion and unload those, those tissues that may be sensitized under stress, right? And we can, we can start to uncouple breathing and pain patterns from some of that, some of that pain that's going on. So... What we'll see is we want to give people an immediate out. Hey, here's how you should treat this. You know, you break something off. You know, you need to know how to put the faucet back together. You need to know how to, you know, restart your iPhone, right? That's it. But that doesn't tell us necessarily about best practice. And what we try to do in our gym and have been doing now for 13 years is we get people working competently at the limits of their capacity for the day. And that's it. It's a moving target. And for some of us, we came to the game late and some of us were geniuses and we move well. And I'm not one of those people. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm a skilled mover now, but what we do is we say, Hey, look, we do this drill called the 27 squats that came from one of our friends named Yami Tikkanen. And it's a way that I teach everyone how to think about foot position. And if you're standing and you have your, your look down and your ankles in the middle of your foot, and your balance between the ball of your foot and your heel, that's sort of our reference position for the ankle. When I squat or jump, when I'm compressing, I should be balanced between ball of foot and the heel. When I swing a kettlebell, et cetera, et cetera. Ankles don't wobble, I don't wobble, but my job is to try to minimize how much wobbling and gimbling I go from front to back. But now I'm gonna take your feet, turn them out 30 degrees, hold that same position. Turn your feet in 30 degrees, make your right foot forward, squat again. And what I'm seeing is that some of us don't have the range of motion, our ankles and our hips. We don't have the skill, right? We're, we get down there, but we can't breathe. Great. Now what we can say is, hey, let's work on the limits of your position today, which means not everyone deadlifts from the floor, right? It's not an accident that kettlebell swing starts from the high hang position, that all Olympic lifting is taught from usually the high hang position, not from the floor, but from swing first, right? Because that's where I have the most range of motion. Then when we have people competent in some of these basic shapes, we can begin to open up that range of motion and challenge their capacities as we move to full range. But if I can't put my arms over my head and I jump up on the pull-up bar and I start doing radical kipping pull-ups and I'm mm-hmm. swinging around, what do you think? Do you think you magically had full range of motion going over your head because you're hanging from a pull-up bar? No, you did not. What you're experiencing is your ability to compensate. Let's say that I'm, I'm a runner. And I'm a heel striker and I love my heel striking. Yeah, I've been heel striking my whole life, right? Heel strikers for life. Then I'm like, take off your shoes and let's go run again. And you see that your technique suddenly reverts into natural running, into normal running, which is not heel striking. You cannot run fast on a hard surface barefoot unless you revert to the way you're supposed to run. 
So suddenly what you're saying is, oh, okay, I move this way when I have this special shoe on, when I have this special compensation. And what we can begin to say is, hey, there's nothing wrong with heel striking. It's very effective, but it doesn't transfer very well to speed. And notice that you have two different skills going on here. So let's get you working towards always thinking that skill is an unlimited vessel and that we can always become more skilled, especially as we get older. I am now turning 45 this year, and I'll take my 45-year-old skilled self over my 20-year-old meathead self any day, right? Mm. I'll beat the crap out of that kid because mm-hmm. he can't keep up with my skilled self. And that gives me hope. Even though my engine doesn't get as hot, even though I'm not as strong as I possibly could be because I'm 45 and I have these real world demands and I don't live in my truck and train three times a day, I'll tell you that I can continue to become a skilled mover and continue to refine that skill. And no wonder Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the future because you can continue to roll until you're dead and you can be a more skilled mover to your dead. In fact, if you want a humbling experience, go just tap on the shoulder of a 60-year-old Brazilian judoka you know, judo- and let me know how that goes for you. Mm. You know, you're going to get crushed right. by a really, really skilled mover. Right. And that's, that's interesting. Once again, here, here's an example you know, of, of, you know, we see that young kids are limited by their pitch counts in, in baseball, softball, right? And the pitch count was a way of saying, hey, here's roughly how much volume we think you should do or not do. I think those pitch counts are way too low that if we give kids the right input, we can get a lot more pitching out of them. And that's an example, right? We just, let's take the brakes off of our human function. Let's stop making it so secret squirrel precious, eat some vegetables, sleep, do some down regulation, be in some loving relationships, you know, talk about your feelings, breathe hard, lift something heavy. See you when you're hundred. Yeah, man. Powerful. And speaking of talking about feelings, and processing stuff, going through um, uh, even a, a traumatic experience. So you've got a one of your family members, you've got a kid who recently broke their leg. I believe you said it was a tibia, and my son That's no, right. and my son broke his fibula, and this was just a couple months ago. And seeing him going through that process mentally more so than anything, and then the recovery process. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what are some things for us to look forward for with recovery for something like that, and just share a little bit of the story of, of what happened and kind of the process that she had to go through. Yeah, my, this is my oldest daughter. I have permission to talk about it. She's 12 years old, working on her backflip with a coach on a super trampoline at Woodward, which is a trampoline extreme park, right? A place where we teach kids to backflip into foam pits and skate and do all this stuff. And she just caught a weird double bounce, pre-puberty, took, snapped her tibia, bad spiral fracture. Didn't go through the growth plate, didn't have to have external fixation, didn't have surgery, we, we dodged. But she's in the middle of volleyball season and she is a volleyball player and loves volleyball. And she is the heart of the defense and a scrapper. And we ski as a family and we bike as a family and we race, we paddle race as a family. So suddenly this is gone. And, you know, what we see is anytime we, we really generally say that, hey, look, most of the overuse problems we see, most of the orthopedic sports injuries are really preventable disease. That if we move more efficiently, if we manage our environmental loads, we can buffer that. I mean, the only, there's two really good pieces of research around kids and injury prevention. That is sleep, that kids who get, don't get sleep are likely to get injured. And there is a one-to-one correlation in that. And it's, it's unequivocal. And second, the best pr- predictor of injury for kids is also, do they eat whole foods? Do they eat vegetables and lean proteins and high-quality fats? Right. What, what, you'll see what is, are they making their tissues out of? That's right. Now you're thinking. Principles, right? Hey, what do you got on, what do you got on board? Because I know you can like, eat little chocolate donuts and, and you know, uh, unicorn frappuccinos and still beat me, but I'll see you in a week. I'll see you in two weeks. I'll see you in three weeks. So we're, we're thinking about the long term, right? And um, I mean, the things I used to tell my coach, you know, I'd be like, coach, I'm already pre-stretched. I don't need to stretch. I'm stretched. What do you want me to do the splits, coach? I got you. You know, like, you know, and he was like, no, we're going to warm up because this is how we get better function. Right. So um, the idea here is, you know, with Georgia is, you know, this that's is your, just and that's your fluke. daughter's name, by the way. That's my daughter, my oldest daughter's name. It's just a total fluke accident. I, and I have done the post-mortem. Was she getting enough vitamin D? You know, was we getting enough calcium? Like, was I, am I a bad dad? And like, what's culpable? Normally, what behaviors? She sleeps. She goes to bed at eight thirty. Wakes up at six thirty every night. Like that's our family. My oldest, my youngest daughter goes to bed at eight. Wakes up at six forty-five every night. Right. 
Like we, we protect our sleep. Our kids sleep on chili pads. They circulate cold water underneath the sheet all night long. They have blackout blinds. It's dark in there. Like our, we protect our kids' sleep. So that wasn't it. Kids eat good food. That wasn't it. Just fluke. Yeah. And by the way, uh, my son, same thing. His toe got stuck in the turf, you know, just. Oh, it happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're human beings. And it's messy business being human beings. So what I'll tell you, though, is one, it was useful having the Olympics on the Winter Olympics because every story was about someone being injured at the Winter Olympics and missing the Olympics. So George was like, wow, I didn't realize yeah, that, that the attention. normal experience of being an athlete is there are injuries to overcome. Secondarily, it helps when like Carrie Walsh is her auntie and you know Gabby Reese is her auntie and they send her text messages. That's really nice. Yeah. But um, what we realized is Georgia sees why we ice bath, why we work on breathing because you know, she was in a lot of pain, you know, we, we respect kids' pain, but we don't want to – my kid gorked out on Vicodin and hardcore antibiotics. We were able to manage it with Mark Pro. We use a Mark Pro, which is a muscle stimulation device, which allows us to dump swelling. So they took the cast off after two days. They're worried that it, you know, it wasn't gonna, she's going to have too much swelling. And they were like, well, she doesn't have any swelling. I'm like, yeah, we've been managing swelling from the second hour. She broke her leg, and then we were getting ahead on her swelling with our Mark Pro, once again, which is this – this muscular stem device that causes a contraction, which dumps the lymphatics and removes congestion and swelling, right? We don't ice, we, 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 so we're thinking, hey, what can we control? And suddenly when we have this conversation with our daughter around, hey, now's a chance where we can tweak your, you can tweak your nutrition a little bit. We're gonna have to pull some of the carbohydrate out because you're not moving as much anymore. Because you're not moving, we're going to have to force yourself to go to the gym and get on the in our garage gym and get on the exercise bike. And if, if you follow my wife, Juliette Starrett, you can see some little montages of how we're training our daughter, right? Just to keep that input in, right? How does she tap into her social network? We give her permission to talk about it. She goes to practice. Like, so what the key here is, you know, there are these opportunities to say this was travesty. Let's make lemonade out of lemons. It's not travesty. It, she got injured working on backflips. But there's so many lessons here. And we still got another five weeks in the cast. But I'll tell you, my kid knows how to be uncomfortable. She knows she can breathe through broken leg pain. She knows, you know, what it looks like to have to manage that. Does that create? And this is why we do sport in the first place. Not to win Olympic medals. Not, not to be on a team for any other reason than helps us know ourselves and it helps us know our friends and it helps us see the world very cleanly. And I think this is why I hope that everyone has some kind of competitive or at least a physical practice because it really simplifies in a, in a really easy model what's working in your life and what's not working in your life. Oh man, super powerful stuff. You know, uh, I want to talk to you about something that I've experienced myself since we, like I started thinking about, well, what have I done? It's been pretty random, but um, my SI joint, all right? And, you know, for some people, I mean, again, there can be random things, there can be trauma, but a lot of times there's some issues going on with, you know, how we're treating our body, you know, movement. Um, uh, for me, I remember the last time that I had this SI joint dysfunction flare up was traveling back to back to back. Oh. And yeah. then getting out, out of the plane, into cars, sitting down for interviews. Because, you know, as you know, right now I'm in my studio and I'm standing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the SI joint. What some of the resulting uh, uh, symptoms can be for people. And what are some things we can do to help to get that that uh, sorted out for ourselves if we are experiencing some SI joint issues? Well, so let's let's clarify that. So, you know, before we even say SI joint, which is sacroiliac joint, that's the interface between your sacrum, the bottom of your spine and your pelvis, right? That's, you have two SI joints there. And what we want people to understand is this is a dynamic joint. It's supposed yeah. to move. Every time you walk, there's motion there. But once it gets jammed, you have had SI pain, it is no joke and really feels like, ugh, because what we try to do is we try to help people conceptualize their body in terms of priorities and systems. And one of the things that we see as the greatest limiter to performance is central nervous system readiness. And I'm talking about your brain's perception of what's going on, right? Not our, am I, is my CNS cooked? I'm talking about like, you know, are you trashed? Is that, is that a net negative, you know, input to the central nervous system? 
you know, that oftentimes the body's ready, but the brain is not. The interface, the neuro, neuromuscular junction is cooked, right? And what we see then is when we prioritize nervous system, we can then say, well, we also prioritize nervous system when we're looking at movement. And then for us, and someone like Stuart McGill, who's a great therapist and brilliant uh, clinician, we say spine first because we see the spine and the shape of the spine as one of the biggest limiters to output. That if I start putting kinks in the spine, I see output problems. If I start tweaking the spine, I can't breathe, which means I can't stabilize. I can't create as much intra-abdominal pressure. My body has all these really cr clever ways to try to protect itself and really guard the spine. And anyone who's listening, who's ever had back pain can relate. So we always, we, at our courses, we say this. I'm like, all right, how many people have you had spine pain, like low back pain? And everyone raise their hand. Because it's normal to have this as a human being. This is just typical, right? This, the design is sometimes you know, we have some weird inputs. And, uh, and I was like, now remember, now compare that to the time you sprained your ankle. People were like, yeah, the ankle sprain was a pain in the butt. But I got on. In fact, you probably finished the soccer game with that sprained ankle, right? You just kept, you kept lifting. But when you tweaked your back, mm -mm, you were done. And the reason we, our brains protect our nervous system so much is that if we have an insult to the nervous system, Man, we cannot move around. We cannot feed ourselves. We cannot reproduce. We cannot generate force. You can barely breathe. You can't even get up off the ground, right? It's a big deal. And such a root of chronic, chronic pain in America. And part of understanding how the spine is supposed to function is that we have to put these inputs into the spine. The spine is supposed to flex. The spine is supposed to extend. So if you jump into something that looks like sun salutation, for example, that's what the yogis did first thing in the morning, 10 minutes of some breathing and really gentle positions where you just got thing, restored motion from being, after being stiff, all of a sudden you see that sun salutation is really a practice of just taking the body and function parts of the body like the spine through normal physiologic range, not trying to become super hypermobile Cirque du Soleil hand balancer guy, right? It's not that. It's about moving the way I'm supposed to move. But if I look at what people's movement diet is during the day, our language, we have like 10 words, sit, walk a little bit, sit, walk a little bit, you know, that's it. Lay on the couch. <clears throat> and what we've done is we haven't taken the hips through their full range of motion. We haven't exposed the spine to its normal ranges. We haven't flexed the spine. We have, you know, and so what we see is suddenly, hey, I have some dysfunction. I've been sitting, my, my body adapts and the spine, the, you know, their butt is really a non-weight bearing surface. And when we're designed to sit, we're designed to sit on the ground, not designed necessarily to sit in a chair at this kind of weird 90-90 angle, which then when you stand up and move around can cause loss of function. And that loss of function or downregulation, degradation of function shows up for you as, as a little tweak in your, in your low back. So suddenly what we start to see is, hey, I've lit up my spine. I've taken one of my joints into a range where my brain's like, mm -mm, no, you didn't. And then it starts, the brain starts turning on all the emergency stabilizers. Well, you know what? This thing's going to get worse. So let's fire up the psoas. Let's put that QL into spasm. Let's make sure that the piriformis goes in lockdown, right? And all of a sudden, you can't even tell what's what now because your brain, your nervous system is protecting you. It's doing its primal job. What we want to do is keep, get people understanding that, hey, you know, can you move yourself a little bit more the way you're supposed to every day? So if you're traveling, and I know that you are because welcome to being a modern human, one of the things you're going to have to do is when you get off the airplane, I need you to go for a walk. One of the biggest mistakes, because we always want to make it simple again, one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of our athletes do, and you're a good example, you are training hard but doing a ton of traveling, but what you weren't doing is moving enough during the day. So there's a great concept in physical therapy called mechanotransduction, which is a fancy term that says, I need mechanical input into my cells and tissues for those cells and tissues to be able to express normal function. That if I don't load my tendons, my tendons will become weaker. Okay, that makes sense. We told women forever and ever, hey, look, you got to walk and take calcium. Well, it turns out walking wasn't enough pounding to uptake the calcium. You had to load. Then when you loaded, the bones were like, I know what this is. It's queuing to get stronger. Give me that calcium, right? One of our friends, Katie Bowman, who wrote a great book called Move Your DNA, which is fabulous, 
talks about this example of the orcas that have the tall fin. And in, when you take an orca whale and you put it in captivity, oftentimes that fin starts to droop. And what we can see, and it's called folded fin or floppy fin syndrome, and it's a great example of two things. One is that because we've changed the environment of the orca, the orca is now spending more time at the surface. And because it's not being supported by water, that fin, not just when it breathes and comes down, it has higher forces on it, right? But secondarily, so that's us sitting, flying, not moving, right? Not eating right, not sleeping, being a stress case, not, you know, not being in loving relationships, not having a community, like all the things that are important. But now, because that orca isn't swimming very fast all the time, sprinting and hunting, there's no force pushing on that fin very often. And guess what happens? The collagen at the base of the fin starts to degrade because it's not exposed and it's not reinforcing itself under normal forces. And so it starts to fold over. So your SI joint is really the same thing as that folded fin syndrome. And then what we can begin to say is, well, what are, the, what are the minimum requirements? Well, one of the first things you can do if you have back pain is to begin walking. And that might be five minutes at a time, three minutes at a time. The first thing we want to do is restore your function. You're not going to make yourself worse walking. In fact, you need to, to move your decongested tissues, to put those loads in. And what we think is, what we're coming to understand is that that 10,000 steps everyone's heard of before, that's our minimum therapeutic dose. As you know in your book, one of the easiest ways to get people to start sleeping again is to get them to move a little bit more during the day. So that if you're having a hard time sleeping, you have back pain, guess what? We're gonna knock both those things out and we're gonna call, it's called walking. And that is what human beings are supposed to do. We're not supposed to drive to the mall and drive to the grocery store and drive, like we're supposed to walk. So see if you can't kick that up to 10,000 steps on a low day. And that means when you get home, and you've only walked 8,000, you need to go for a walk before you go to bed. Get your steps in. And I can't tell you the power of that. And if you look at what's going on with Stan Efferding and Mark Bell and some of these amazing coaches, uh, Joe Ken, strength coach for the Jaguars, what you'll see is they all have begun walking practices. They walk a little bit in the morning. They move around during the day, right? You're standing right now, which is the same thing as walking, right? Being active. And so what we want to do is start to say, okay, well, now we understand that there are how that's an environmental pattern problem. And then we can say, well, what's the minimum dose? Because you don't need to squat 400 to have a healthy back. But I can tell you that the, the women in Africa who carry very large loads on their heads, right? They have the biggest discs in the group. They have the highest disc spaces and they're, it's counterintuitive because they load their spines all the time. Their spines are solid and rock steady and, right? And I think... One of the issues that we're going to confront, and especially as we're talking about chronic pain and the fact that some of us are really struggling to sleep and to feel good and to want to have like a high sex drive, et cetera, et cetera, is that we need to get back to the principles that made us human. Yeah. And then we can start to say, this is the next. So if you pin me down, you're like, Kelly, I want elite performance. What am I going to do? I'm like, well, you should probably read a book on sleep. I have a friend who's written one. I'm telling you, that's the number one. And number two, you need to walk a little bit more during the day. And when we start to move around a little bit more during the day, we start to sleep, then we can have the next conversation about eating vegetables. And then we can have the next conversation about which coffee and how much fat you should put in there. And then the next conversation, should you swing kettlebell or deadlift? But let's get first principles first. And it's a shame that you and I are spending... This is like, you didn't want to lecture adults about sleeping. That wasn't my, that wasn't your <laughs> life dream as a child. Yeah. It wasn't my dream as a child to lecture people about posture. Yet it turns out we have to because we suddenly find ourselves as strangers in a strange land and the conditions that make us human. Look, here's a challenge for you. If you have a little kid at home and you have a Saturday, do everything your little kid does. Toddlers, toddlers walk two and a half miles a day on average. Toddlers, you do not walk two and a half miles a day. Mm. Every time they get up and off the ground, do it. Every time they jump and land, do it. Every time they sprint somewhere, do it. You're going to be so cooked. And what you're going to realize <laughs> is that you don't have to warm up as much. You don't have to activate your glutes as much. You don't have to do all of these mobilizations or skilled tissues or position transfer exercises because you are maintaining and nourishing that normal range of motion and healthy tissues just by the fact that you're being a human being. Man, this is like real like one of the big headlines for today is being more human. That's what this is really about, you know, when you think about even walking, man, like you, the context you just shared is like medicine. 
you know? And it's like yes. one of these fundamental things, top of the list, like we shouldn't even be talking about kale yet, you know? Like, are you walking? <laughs> and no, so like no. from my firsthand experience- It's not sexy, it's free. My firsthand experience with the, the SI joint dysfunction, like, and I remember by, by having these practices of like, you know, taking my family, going for these walks, and then I'm in this condition all of a sudden where my brain, the central governor, is just like craving it. Like as I'm driving to the next interview, like I really need to, to get a walk in. Like I just really need to walk. Then, I, then I'll force it down. Like, you know what? I'll do it after this. And then the next thing happens. And, and the next thing happens before you know it, you've created this pattern where you're putting yourself in a compromised, literally compromised physical con, uh, position, right? And so, and my body's just revolting. How about, how about not compromised? Let's say... Let's say compensated, right? Compensated. And that's the key is that because sometimes compromise has this negative association to it. And certainly I can say, hey, that position doesn't transfer as well. This is why we're training this position. And what we can say is, hey, this lifestyle compensation, it works and it's going to have to work sometimes. Go ahead and have a baby. Go ahead and be up all night puking. Go ahead and have a job. Travel to the East Coast and back in one day. Let me know how your perfect little routine works, how your body, it doesn't work. So what we think is, hey, how can I build in some capacity and slack into the system so that when these things come on that I can't control, I, my full physical practice doesn't go out the door. For example, when, when we look at sugar, you know, there's no, no one is going to debate that sh we should eat less sugar, like eat less sugar people like, and I love cookies. I love ice cream. That's my jam. But when I'm stressed, I do not eat cookies and ice cream. Why? Because I can't handle it because I'm sleep deprived and stressed. And so my body is a lot more sensitive to it. In the last two years, my drinking has dropped to, and I wasn't a big drinker before because it just didn't make me feel good. But like, I literally have one drink every two weeks now, maybe. Right. I just don't drink. My, and that's a beer or, you know, and what I'll tell you is I definitely don't drink when I'm sleep deprived and stressed because I can't handle that at all. I see that. So what I'm saying is let's do the fun, central, like we're human beings party on the pizza when you're rested. Right. Mm. Not when you're stressed. Mm. Go binge drink when you're rested, not when you're stressed. Go eat that pint of ice cream when you're rested. Go, you know, so think about also. It's not about did I eat perfectly and did I exercise today, did I train today. It's about controlling all of those components, sleep, downregulation, stress, create a physical practice that lasts for 24 hours a day and then nail as many things as you can. You know, one of the things that uh, we started a couple of years ago, we started a walking school bus at our kids' school. So we live about a mile and a half from school. We have about 30 kids who show up in the morning and we all walk to school together, right? Parents drop their kids off. Mm. And, and that's about, you know, so our kids walk at least a mile and a half in there. They get some steps. We had a couple of parents come up to us at the end of the year. And they're like, this is amazing. I lost 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you lost 20 pounds walking two miles to school. Like how messed up are you? And what it means is that our bodies are craving this basic input. And what we're trying to do then, for example, if I, if I don't want to eat cookies in the house, if I don't want to eat all the cookies, I just don't buy cookies. I create an environment where I can make the good choice, right? Like you don't have a, I see a stool in the corner, but there's no stool there. So if you want the stool, you have to go get the stool. Yeah. And what that means is that you automatically come in and do the right thing. So let's set ourselves up so that we don't have to make another choice. Let's set ourselves up so that we can, you know, hey, I walk my kids to school in the morning. If the day goes to hell in a handbasket, I have gotten hot, I've done eight minutes of breathing, I've eaten a vegetable and I walked two and a half miles, like nailed it. And that doesn't matter that I have done some physical practice. It's not a perfect practice, but now I can bridge to the days where I do have a little more time, a little more flexibility. And I think that's what we need. We need to help people sift through this notion that you've either biohacked or nailing every perfect thing and you have this perfect practice of high intensity and it doesn't work that way. Not if you're a parent, not if you're running a business, you just need to make small changes. And as our friend, I've quoted Eric Cressy before already, but Small hinges swing big doors. And that's the way to think about it. Mm, man, there's so much there to unpack. But I, I want to go back really quickly. I mentioned kale. And I, do you know about this? Well, so where I get my kale chips, first of all, Kelly, is from Thrive Market. Do you know about Thrive Market? We love Thrive Market. Yes. Yeah, so Those I knew it. Friends. You see, I knew it. And we didn't talk about this before the show. I knew it because the people that are in the know doing big things, they're utilizing Thrive Market. It's where I get my kale chips. My, my almond butter, my coconut oil, my personal care products, all these things you'll find at 
Great stores like Whole Foods, but you'll get it 25 to 50% off the retail price. I'm serious. It's insane how much money you save. Yeah. And and uh, ethically, morally good people. Yes, that's the thing. There's such a great, the, the people there and the, 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 the mission behind what they're doing is phenomenal. Every membership that is purchased, they give a membership to a low-income family, uh, veteran, uh, somebody who's in need, a teacher. And so, guys, make sure to, to utilize them because I beat myself up every time when I buy something that I could have got at Thrive Market for the full price. Don't don't be like me. In this one area of life, don't be like me. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> and so head over, check them out. It's thrivemarket.com forward slash model health. And you also get an exclusive 25% off every single thing in your cart for your first purchase. In addition... Plus, I'm pretty sure you'll get the free shipping, okay? So it's a little amount that you get the free shipping. Because that can do it for people. I don't know if you've ever done this before, Kelly. Like, you're shopping, and then, you know, you might buy $300 worth of stuff, and then it's like $5 for shipping. You're like, oh, I don't know. But so that free shipping can help as well. So make sure to check them out, thrivemarket.com forward slash model health. They've got categories for paleo, vegan, whatever you're looking for, gluten-free, all the best products, organic, non-GMO all the stuff that we're looking for. Head over, check them out. What I was going to say is the, star, the Starettes are not small people. And when we go to the whole paycheck, Whole Foods, and we fill up our cart with, with food, right? Food takes up space, like veggie. Like we just, it's our carts full of food. Everyone comments on it. They're like, wow, you, wow, you guys eat all that? Wow. And it's gotten <laughs> to the point where I'm, I'm a little offended. I'm like, yeah, I eat all that. You say I'm fat? Like, what are you doing? And now I just say, well, I don't drink. And people are like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And they're really confused and they don't know where to put that. I'm like, because I'm not spending money on alcohol, I'm spending money on kale. But what I'm telling you is that with Thrive, I can hide my consumption habits. I can, hide, I can get all my, you know, oh. I can buy I can buy Thrive and have boxes of food come and I don't get shamed. In the, oh uh, man, the, the boxes. And they also, even the way they package it up, but guys, I'm going to throw this out there. If you're listening, you, you uh-huh. use the Thrive Market, Chipotle spicy mayo. Okay, guys, check that out. All right, uh, I'm just going to throw that out there. there now, Kelly, I just want to ask you about... One more thing. Maybe it's going to have a piece that that's a second piece, but could you give us a checklist? All right. Maybe like three to five things that ideally we should be able to do skills as a human. All right. So you've mentioned before being able to get into a, basically a resting squat position. So would that be one? Like what are, give us a checklist of things that we need to be yeah. able to do. I'm not the first person to say you should be able to squat, but it was the first mobility wide we ever did. Hey, just try to accumulate 10 minutes in the bottom position of a squat. You know, I, when I was 20, I went to Nepal, um, you know, was, a, was teaching kayaking there. And man, everyone can squat down and work on the fire and, you know, the little antis and, you know, selling things. And it's just a fundamental skill that we all lose. Every kid can squat. And then as we get adults, we start making up all these excuses. I have this Scottish hip. My mm-hmm. Achilles are short, uh, right? But what I'm telling you is that every kid can squat and it's a, it's a capacity that is really good for the back. It actually, when we sit in that bottom position, we are restoring normal motion in the SI joint. A lot of the motions that we do, for example, between the pelvis and the spine cause the, the sacrum and the pelvis to lock into a more stable position. That's really useful when I'm sprinting. That's really useful when I'm running or lifting, right? That I can get create more stability, but also to restore those positions to move that fascia, if I squat all the way down, like I'm taking a poop or just hanging out by the fire, my sacrum is going to move in the same direction as my pelvis. And that SI joint, it's called counter nutation of the pelvis, is one of the restorative features. And it's not an accident that Louis Simmons and the powerlifters use the reverse hyper to do the same thing. Yeah. By getting a little bit of that flexion in the bottom position, we can restore that motion. So not only is it a great restorative for the knees and the back and is it what you should be able to do because it gives you a lot of movement options but it's also really really important for your spinal health and if you just spent some more time in that bottom position even you have to hold on to something for a while scale it yeah. hold on turn your feet out if you can't get your feet perfect do the best you can get them as straight as you can hold on to something take little breaks you know and and there are guys like Ido portal who's like hey 30 minutes a day is our goal. And I was like, that's, I agree. <laughs> we should be spending that much time, but. If we can know, just get a minute, that, you know, so, so that's, that's number one. We got the resting squat position and I'm sure you've got a video on it. We'll link up for this episode. So what's another one that we should be able to do? One of the things, and this is subtle. One of the things that I think people should be able to do is, is handle stress and be able to turn themselves off at night. 
And one of the things I think we're really bad at that, I think we've got all these, you know, bulletproof coffee, layered coffee I'm a huge fan of. Um, you know, I love the fats in my coffee, you know. Um, we spin up, we do all, and what we are really bad at is coming down. You know, we ha- you have your like playlist, you know, your perfect jams, you do all your routines, but then at night you're just like, ah, I'm wired. So, you know, and, and this is a problem. And what, uh, one of the things that we try to get people to do is create a little bedtime routine. And I think one of the easiest ways in to the brain and the nervous system is through the soft tissues. And this goes along with what Iyengar said a long time ago. Iyengar said, breath is king of the brain, and nerves are king of the breath. And one of the things that we like people to do is do a little 10 minutes of some foam rolling at night before they go to the bedroom. So if you start a practice where you get on the ground and you roll around and just treat your soft tissues before you go to the bedroom, you are going to sleep better. It's going to switch on some of those parasympathetic aspects of your nervous system. If you've ever had a massage, you never stand up and want to fight someone after a massage, right? You want to, you want to chill and you know, your voice is all low. So, you know, do your soft tissue work in the last 10 minutes before you go to the bedroom. Also that gets the soft tissue work out of the gym, which is important. I want the gym to be about training and about using my time there effectively. If you end up at a gym that's a little miracle, frankly, in mm-hmm. the day. So let's use it to our best. Like I'd rather you do another set of some skill work or climbing or you know squat, do something like that. Save your soft tissue work before you go to the bedroom. <clears throat> we also find that people can do that because the last 10 minutes before you go to the bedroom, nothing good is happening. You are watching TV, you're on Facebook, you're, you're, you know, you're giving your information to the Russian bots, you're doing something <laughs> bad. And what, you can, what you'll feel is that if you get into the habit of just keeping your foam roll right by your, by your – uh, your couch, you'll feel better. In fact, on Mobility Wad, people forget, but we've been programming follow along videos for years. Like we have thousands. Every day I make a brand new video, we don't recycle, and I make one that can be done in the gym, and I make a 10 minute follow along soft tissue down regulation piece. And you don't have to have any experience. You're gonna need a ball and a roller. You don't need any fancy equipment, but I'll take you on an adventure about how your body works for 10 minutes. And what we found is that that 10 minutes is magic, that it's enough to make significant change. It's not so long that you won't do it. Throw it on the TV, watch it on your iPhone, put on your headphones, follow along, and you'll see that you will sleep better. So learning how to turn off is a big deal. Um, And then, you know, I'd say, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I really like people to do is move more during the day. Is that I I have to do a lot less, sort of tissue management if you're just active a little bit more. And that doesn't mean train or not train. That means just, I just need you to move more. And I think what you'll find is that your tissues will heal a little bit better and you'll sleep better. And so, you know, those things, that, that, that's where I'm going. Work on some squatting, you know, work on your shapes. Uh, see if you can put yourself to sleep and then walk around a little bit more during the day. Perfect, perfect, man. All right, super quick here. Another question came up when I was thinking about the process of somebody watching the video or, you know, being on social media. Let's talk really quickly about tech neck. Well, think about this way. If you spend all, you know, the research is that we are spending a lot of time on our smartphones between two and a half and three and a half hours a day. And all kids now are going to be in front of screens more often than not. Right, because that's it's a learning tool, right? I mean, our our school is you know this little public school has every classroom has a Chromebook, every kid has a Google Drive or a Google School, right? I mean, this is this the reality of how they communicate and turn in assignments. What we have to do then is think, hey, is the technology bad? No, but how is it disrupting what I'm supposed to do as a human? So, am I supposed to have my head flexed down for two and a half or three hours a day? And if I am, what are the adaptations? Can I take a full breath there? No. So I'm practicing not being able to breathe. You know, can my shoulders be stable? No. You know, does that change my jaw mechanics? Yes, it does. Because my head changes, I'm more likely to see teeth grinding in that, right? I'm more likely to get headaches. Some of the the squeaky parts of that. Your neck isn't going to explode. But what we want to be thinking of is, you know, the granular piece of this is, even our eyesight is a, is a function of, of these screens and that what we should be doing is looking far, looking close, looking far, looking close. But because we look at this two and a half, three feet all day long, we're not sort of flexing that. We're exposing ourselves to the, to the blue light 
from the LEDs. And there are some real, some physicians and some thinkers out there who are like, hey man, any blue light is really hard on your brain. So the key here is to say, hey, look, technology is not going anywhere, but there are places and patterns where I can put myself into a position where I don't have to worry about my, my shapes. I don't, you know, if I'm at a standing desk and I have a stool, right, and it's at the right height, I'm automatically protected. So again, the way to think about this is I, sh I should be able to look down no problem, but is that the resting habitus? Like I said with the foot, is that resting foot position, can you find that resting foot position? Because if it's not important, then it's not gonna, not gonna end up in the language of Pilates or yoga or powerlifting or Olympic lifting or gymnastics. And guess what? It does. And so yeah. what we're seeing and one more time is practice doesn't make permanent or practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. So what, what positions am I spending the most of my time? Yeah. And I think the key here is that, you know, put your head down, take a breath. Put your head up, take a breath. And what you're going to find is like, wow, I can breathe a lot better if my head is up. All right, now we're talking. That's a reason to keep your head up, not that you're going to explode your neck. And so I think the real thing is we want to recognize that this technology is a miracle and it's changed the quality of our lives forever, but it shouldn't dictate how the human moves through the environment at such an incessant, consistent way. And it does, unfortunately. So look, I don't want to be a little bent over hunched man when I'm old. And there's an easy way. I just try to think about it. I just, hey, be less hunchy, you know? <laughs> and I think that's what we want to see. I, I, I think the problem is we are going to see fundamentally that because we don't have some of these pieces in place to inoculate ourselves from this movement, we are going to see a generation of kids and potentially users of this tech who feel shaped by the tech. The same way the chair has shaped us. The same way the dog has changed our interaction with the world, right? Like we are constantly adapting machines and i think sometimes it's difficult for us to see the implications of all the stressors on the body because we don't we haven't run the experiment long enough so what i can say is hey if your head in that position you're not going to squat or deadlift very well you're not going to put your arms over your head or take a big breath and you might grind your teeth that's going to be a problem what i can't say is that it's going to be a real problem but i'll see you in 50 years and we'll know mm, man 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 kelly you're one of the smartest people walking around on two legs. Oh. Sometimes, sometimes four, probably getting your bear crawl on. I don't know, man, but <laughs> you're amazing. And I always love talking with you. And uh, man, just thank you for being you, man. So, so powerful. I can't turn it off. I tell you, you know, um, you know, what's amazing is that I am part of a generation of coaches and coaches and thinkers. And I am really proud of this generation. And I think everyone feels that way. But I think we're finally coming in. There's, I have a bunch of mates in their 30s and 40s and 50s who are, you know, have a voice, Jocko Willink, Tim Ferriss, you, um, you know, Aubrey, who are really helping. I mean, Joe Rogan has changed the face of the human, of the, of the, you know, the human, humankind, you know, has put more on to people's radar and help people understand and conceptualize what a better life looks like. And because we're all doing this, it's, I'm really proud to be of this generation. We'll write a book in 30 or 40 years and just be like, wow, what happened? There was a happening here. Yeah. And it was like a human awakening where we got back to being human. It's, it's really exciting. So I appreciate that. And I'm really proud to be of this generation. Perfect, man. Can you let everybody know where they can connect with you online and where they can also follow all your cool stuff that you're doing? We are at MobilityWOD, W-O-D. And uh, dot com at MobilityWatt is our handles. You know, if you want to um, have a conversation with my wife, sometimes my wife gets left out as, you know, the she's the CEO of this hot mess. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just launched some sessions with kind of a radio project called um, The Ready State. And what we have too many friends who have really great podcasts, but we wanted to have some con extended conversations around topics that we were interested in. So we just dropped eight of those. We're going to take on pain for another eight. And then so we're doing these little sessions, going quiet, doing some sessions, going quiet. But if you want to hear kind of what we're talking about and some of the things that we're working on, you know, follow us at the, the Ready State on podcast. And then more importantly, and that's on iTunes, everywhere else. But, uh, you know, come jump along. We have a free trial on the website. If you're having a hard time sleeping or want to feel better, 
come just play along with the, uh, the the down regulation recover piece. And I think you'd be blown away that after 10 days, you can't give it up. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we'll link everything up in the show notes. And man, just again, thank you so much for being a superhero in this world, man. I appreciate you. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And uh, go team. Best family I ever had. Yes, sir. Go team. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Like I said, uh, Kelly is one of the smartest people walking around on the planet. And um, man, I learned a lot from him. And every time that I hear him speak, every time that, you know, today I was like immersing myself in his world before the show and also, you know, just through the week and just pick up so many little nuggets that are buried within nuggets. And it's just like so powerful, man. And uh, he's a great thinker, but also the application, you know, and the, the athletes that he's worked with and, you know, the everyday folks that, you know, helping them to become more functional, but also, you know, getting folks out of pain as well. And he's got a tremendous amount of of insights and tips and tools and strategies with the mobility wad so listen seriously do yourself a favor put that on your um, mental and also your your manual rolodex all right on your computer of course i don't know who has a rolodex anymore but just so that you can have access when you need it all right i would prefer you though to do it proactively all right. Let's not get to a place where you need to do some mobility and drills and things like that, but proactively engage this in part of your life. And by the way, I love when he said, be less hunchy. All right. That's the goal for today. Be less hunchy. Pay attention to how you're utilizing your smart devices. Like seriously, you think about how much time you're putting your body in that position and how he said this multiple times, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And we don't really know the full ramifications that we're going to have by utilizing our, our, our head like that and keeping our head down all the time. So even just bring the phone up a little bit. It might look a little weird. I don't know. Um, but also be mindful. Maybe you will spend a little bit less time on it and more time engaging with the rest of the world, right? And I'm talking about in your physical presence, all right? The world isn't just, you know, we have this ironic thing where we've got more friends than ever on Facebook, but less friends in the real life. You know, so be mindful of that and, and invest in both. Not saying that one is, is, is bad, but we want to engage with life, right? We are human and to be human is to engage, is to live, is to engage with our environment, all right? We've dove so deeply into our phones that we forget sometimes that we have this world around us to engage with. So that's another big message from today. And listen, I'm telling you what, we want to stay ready right? You don't want to be in a situation where you have to get ready for something to happen, right? We don't want to be like the Jaguar. We don't want to be like the Jaguar. He pulled his hammy, all right? We want to stay ready, be proactive, get this mobility uh, practice into your life so that you're ready for whatever life happens to throw your way. All right. I appreciate you so much. We've got some incredible guests and incredible show topics coming up. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. So make sure you stay ready. All right. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.